brothers and sisters, this is the Remnant Warrior from Kingdom Productions Network. I wanted to thank you all for watching this video and all Kingdom Productions Network content and ask that you please hit the like button because it truly helps the channel grow and new people see the content. And if you aren't already subscribed, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you'll know each time we upload new content. Grace and peace. Okay, good day, brothers and sisters. Um, we are going, um, we are continuing with our study on Revelation. And um, it was supposed to be, initially it was supposed to be a study on Revelation chapter 1 only, but I've decided to um, do more studies on the book of Revelation. Now, today I want to look at Revelation chapter 2 from verses 1 to 7. So Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 to 7 is um, the letter to the church in Ephesus. Okay. Now, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. So obviously this is um, the words of Jesus Christ because we know from um, Revelation chapter 1 we know that Jesus Christ is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and he's walking among the um, seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. So he commends them for being hard workers, uh, doing good deeds, and also persevering under trials and suffering and tribulation. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. So these guys um, have a certain level of discernment, but their discernment only goes up to a certain level. Um, I'll show you now. You will see just now what I mean by that. So they don't tolerate wicked people, but up until a point. Let's see. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Now listen carefully. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from the place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the needs of light, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise as well. The reason why I'm saying that they only have discernment to a certain point is because they have forsaken their first love. Now, their first love is Jesus Christ. For that, that should be the first love of any Christian, any Sincere believer, um, your true love, your first love should be Jesus Christ. Okay, so if you if your first love is not Jesus Christ, then obviously you you are um, seeking something else in His place. You are putting something else in His place, or you are under the illusion that you should. Have Jesus plus something else or someone else. All right. Now, if we go and look at the history of the um, church in Ephesus, and when you go and you read the book of Acts, and you look at Acts chapter 19, you'll see that Paul had quite a hard time in Ephesus when he went there. Because, uh, Paul. First of all, he had to explain to them that they needed the Holy Spirit. Okay. Then he needed to explain to them that having idols is not going to help him. Worshipping idols is a pagan practice. Um, it will cause you to end up in hell. 
Okay. The moment he started preaching Jesus, a whole group of pagans, basically a pagan cult in the city of Ephesus, um, went up against him. And they cried out, Blessed is um, Artemis, the, um, the god of Ephesus. Now, what's interesting is Artemis is also named Diana. Okay, and this is a goddess associated with the moon. Okay, it's basically the same goddess that uh, is spoken of when when uh, people mention Ishtar and Inanna and so on. She's basically seen as a goddess of light, of wisdom and so on. She's a light bearer. Now that should immediately make the sirens go off in your head because what is light bearer and what is someone who pretends to have light? What is that? That is spirit of Antichrist, yes, but it's also more specifically related to the adversary, to Satan himself. Because the name Lucifer um, is means light bringer, okay? It can also be associated with a light bearer. But the thing is, the Apostle Paul warns us and he says that a light bearer, uh, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So he's a light bearer and his light looks good. But it is the ultimate deception. Okay. It's the ultimate deception. Now that's the problem. In Ephesus, you'll see that the moment that Paul started preaching the gospel, you'll see that there's a violent reaction. Now, you see this time and time again with missionaries and so on. We do missionary work. You can go anywhere overseas. In an in a African country, you can go to somewhere in Canada or the United Kingdom, Australia, anywhere. You can talk about Buddha. Nothing will happen. You can talk about Allah and Muhammad. Nothing will happen. You can talk about Krishna. Nothing will happen. But the moment you mention the name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, immediately there's, an re there's a reaction. Why? Because those of you who are acquainted with the research done by the late Mike, Dr. Michael Weiser will know that um, when you look at Deuteronomy 32 verses 8 and 9, and you look at it, in the way that it is phrased in the Dead Sea Scrolls and also in the Septuagint, you'll see that it says that God divided the nations according to the sons of God or the heavenly beings. Okay. The Masoretic text says according to the sons of Israel or the Israelites. But research by Dr. Michael Weiser has shown that the correct reading is the one that comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint because that's the one that's the earliest known wording of Deuteronomy 32 verses 89. So if you are acquainted with that research, then you will know that uh, different pieces, of different regions on the earth and different countries have been allocated to certain principalities and entities, okay? We also um, read about one of those principalities in the book of Daniel, where, um, we, where they, we see the, the prince of um, Persia, okay? There's also another one mentioned, the prince of Greece. Now, obviously, these are fallen entities, okay? Who are, um, they are basically in control over a certain region. Now, the same with Ephesus. There was a principality in control here, and in any place that you go on this earth, the moment you speak, you mention the name of Jesus Christ, these principalities react. And there's a whole spiritual atmosphere there that gets disturbed because they know who Jesus Christ is, and they are fearful of it. And they will do anything in the power. They will sweep everyone up 
to attack the missionary, to falsely accuse the missionary, to um, shout insults at the, at the missionary in order to get the missionary to go away. Now, they tried the same thing with Paul. Paul didn't go away. Instead of going away, he remained there for months. And in the end, I think he was like two or three years in Ephesus. Okay. Now, this um, fallen angel who appears as a woman, in this case, Diana or um, Artemis, also known as Inanna or Ishtar, this entity had a certain form of control over the region of Ephesus. Okay. And the moment Paul mentioned the name of Jesus, there, there was a violent reaction. Now, if we understand that old background, getting back to Revelation 2, Revelation 2, chapter 1 to 7, we see that John is um, receiving these words from Jesus for the letter that he needs to write. And one of the things that Jesus warned Ephesus about is that um, he says in verse 4, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how, you, how far you have fallen. In other words, he's basically saying to the church in Ephesus that you have forsaken the love that you had first, the love for Jesus. Okay? And you are under the impression that you need Jesus plus someone or something else. Now, I will propose to you that the church in Ephesus was in a constant struggle between going back to the pagan practices of the pagan cults in Ephesus. Um, and obviously they were persecuted. I mean, he says it here clear, clearly, um, you have endured the hardships uh, for my name and I have not grown weary. So they haven't grown weary, so they don't give up. Now the devil tries another technique, and this technique is more subtle. His direct attacks didn't help, but now he tries a technique that's more subtle. And that is by infiltrating the fellowship in Ephesus with strange teachings and so on. In this regard, it is mentioned, however, that in verse 6, but you have this in your favor, you like the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also had. Now, the Nicolaitans were uh, an obscure cult. Um, not much is known about them, but it seems from research that people have done that the Nicolaitans were basically Gnostics. Okay, they um, they called themselves followers of Jesus, but they, they held on to the Gnostic teachings. All right. So they saw knowledge as more important um, than love for God and love for your fellow man. Okay, that's the problem with Gnosticism overall. So this church in Ephesus had, they had um, discernment up to a certain degree. They had enough to discernment to see through the, the Gnostic um, agenda of the Nicolaitans, but they couldn't see through certain other false teachings. Okay. The, this principality that was over Ephesus constantly swept people up against them. And when the direct attack, attack didn't succeed, it tried a more subtle attack. And that is by infiltrating the church or the fellowship with strange teachings. And many times these strange teachings are the lies that tells you, the lie being told to you that Jesus is not enough. You need Jesus plus something or someone else. And this, it would seem, was the main problem in the church of Ephesus. Okay. Now, later on in verse 7, the final verse um, in the letter to the church in Ephesus, it says, Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, this reminds us of what Jesus Christ said during his earthly ministry. And when he said this, he quoted the prophet Isaiah a lot. Jesus Christ said that let those who have ears to see, let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Those who have eyes to see, let them see. He was quoting the prophet Isaiah because that's something that the prophet Isaiah said a lot. It says, if you, those of you who have eyes to see, 
Sí. Those who have ears to hear, you must hear. The thing is that Jesus Christ knew that people who were religious, okay, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he knew that they were physically not blind, but spiritually they were blind. So are you spiritually, are your spiritual eyes open or are, they, are you blind? You see, it comes back again to the discernment, and the only way in which you can have true discernment is when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and um, when the Holy Spirit gives you that gift of discernment. That's the only way. Okay? There's no there's no one else who can give you the gift of discernment. It's only the Holy Spirit. Whoever has ears, they can hear what the Spirit says to the church. In other words, the the church in Ephesus heard some of the things that the Holy Spirit said to them, but not all. Their ears were deaf to certain things, and that's why they have forsaken their first love. Okay? To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, what's interesting here is in the paradise of God, we know that you have the tree of um, the knowledge of good and evil, as well as the tree of life. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is one thing. It's um, the tree that Satan tempted Adam and Eve with. He said, if you eat of the fruit of this tree, you will surely not die. You will become like God in knowing good and evil. We know that the whole lie that he told Eve. But now the Lord says, if you are victorious, in other words, if you keep your faith until the end, if you endure until the, until the end, I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life. That's, that's huge. That's amazing. The tree of life is the very tree itself in paradise which harbors life. Okay? This is this is the very tree which forms the center of paradise. We human beings didn't have the right. We don't have the right to eat from the tree of life. But the Lord says, if you endure to the very end, you will be victorious and I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life. In other words, you will have life eternal. And, you know, at this moment, where we are on planet Earth and where we are in this world, we, with our human understanding, cannot comprehend the aspect of eternal life. We can't comprehend it. It's simply too amazing for us to understand. And that is why the Bible also says that no eye, what, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, um, so amazing will the things be that God has prepared for us? We know that Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Here we have another promise. I will give you to eat from the, the fruit of the, uh, the tree of uh, life, which is in the paradise of God. But once again, one of the key words here is repentance. If we go back to verse 5, consider how far you have fallen, repent and do the things you did at first. In other words, Go back to your sound teaching that you had at the beginning. Don't listen to false doctrine and repent of the false doctrine that you did. So don't go back and pretend as if nothing has happened. Repent of the, the false teachings that you follow and then go back to the sound teaching that you had at the beginning and continue with that. And obviously repentance is... Um, has sadly become a swear word in, in many churches today. They don't want to talk about repentance. But we know the Bible says that repentance is absolutely crucial. So that's it for Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. And um, let me just um, end this with a prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you in the wonderful name above names the names of the name of jesus christ 
through the powerful working of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you uh, for everything. Lord, we thank you for your word, which is the truth. Lord, please sanctify us in your truth. Your word is the truth, Lord. Lord, please help us that we will endure and that we will listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Please make our ears deaf to any false doctrines. Lord, please help us to have the armor of God on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit, which is your living word. Lord, we thank you for your word, light which, which drives away the darkness. We praise and we glorify your name. Lord, please guard our hearts, guard our thoughts, guard our minds, our speech. Please, please cleanse our bodies, minds, and souls, Lord, and help us to focus on Christ Jesus, our wonderful counselor, our Lord and our Savior. I pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good day, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> I hope and trust you are all well and that you will have a blessed last day of 2023. And I wish you all the grace, mercy and peace of Christ Jesus our Lord for the new year in 2024. Uh, today we are going to look at Revelation chapter 2. We are going to look at verse 8 to verse 11. Uh, this is the uh, letter to the church in Smyrna. Now John writes the following. He says, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. Now, let's just stop there for a moment. Obviously, he's saying that these are the words of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the one who died and came to life again. You know, in this day and time that we live in, uh, interfaith, uh, interfaith uh, agendas and universalism, as a whole, is such a part of the popular agenda. Now, the ideology of universalism basically tells you uh, the lie that all religions are the same, and there are many ways to God. And that's also one of the things that are, one of the philosophies that are prominently present in the New Age movement. They tell you that essentially, um, you know, the Buddhists are right, the Hindus are right, Christians are right, um, Islam, Islamists are right, uh, the Jews are right, everyone, everyone is okay, you know. You don't need Jesus Christ, and they tell you that you don't need him because there are many ways to God. So if you want to go to God through Krishna, and do transcendental meditation, and whatever they call it, um, Kundalini yoga, and all, all that garbage, then it's fine. Uh, it focuses on a philosophy of individual happiness and i put happiness in quotation marks because what they perceive as happiness is actually is actually misery people who have been in new age uh, all of them tell you that you know they in new age they tell you you will be happy you just have to you know, hold to this ideology of universalism and do yoga and meditate and uh, spread love and um, speak life and whatever, and you will be happy. But they always felt, while they were in the movement, they always felt that there was a big hole in inside of them that they couldn't explain. And they tried to fill that hole with more and more Eastern philosophies and Eastern mysticism and this and that and interfaith whatever and universalism and the more they try that the less they succeed the more they fail and in the end they end up miserable um, they always feel like they are doing all this stuff but it's actually dead 
There's no life. And the moment they come to Christ Jesus and they get born again, then they will tell you that that hole inside that they always felt, that deep dark hole has now been filled and they experience true life. They experience the life which is Jesus Christ and they experience the powerful working of the Holy Spirit. And they experience the way that God the Father is working in their lives by the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. So why I'm talking about all this is because what John writes in verse 8 here, he says, these are the words of him who is the first and the last. Now, you can take all the religions in the world. There are hundreds of religions. Okay. You can take them all and you can compare them to Christianity. There's only one religion. There's only one faith where there is a king who is the king of kings who came to earth in order to basically humiliate himself by taking on the form of man, humiliating himself by being becoming a suffering servant. Okay, and giving his life on the cross so that people may have life. And when he went to the grave, what happened? The tomb is empty. When the angels asked the, the Mary and the disciples, who are you looking for? And they, they were crying and they said, oh, we were, we were looking for Jesus. He was crucified. He was buried. And so... And then the angel asked them a very good question that should stop anybody in their tracks. The angel asked them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Now, Jesus Christ is life. He gives life in abundance. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? In no other religion in the world... You can go and research all hundreds of those religions. You can research all of them. But in no one will you find a king who humiliated himself, taking on the form of a man, sacrificing himself so that those who follow him may have life in abundance, and then raising from the dead and ascending to heaven. Muhammad died. Buddha died. The Hindu gurus die, and that's the end. They believe they reincarnate, which we know is a lie from the pit of hell. But death is the end of is, is, is basically the end for them. They can't conquer death, and then when they die and they when they open their eyes, they are in the place of the dead. And on the day of judgment, they will be thrown into the lake of fire, which is very sad because um, obviously the Lord wants everyone to to come to you know to have salvation. It doesn't. The Lord doesn't take pleasure in sending people to hell. It, it doesn't. He doesn't find pleasure in seeing people get lost. Okay, so in only one faith, in only one religion, will you find a king humiliating himself. While Jesus was doing his ministry on earth, he never lived in a castle. He never wore fancy clothes. Um, he basically lived, he and his disciples lived like beggars. They lived like homeless people. Now, if you compare that taking the form of a suffering servant, a homeless man, only have one set of clothes, don't have really have money. Um, you take that and you compare it to how a king left. Then you begin to understand how much humiliation Jesus Christ faced and how much he had to humiliate himself. And we know that Jesus didn't, didn't see himself as someone who can abuse 
the aspect of being God, because we know that Jesus was 100% human, but also 100% God. Even while he was on earth as the suffering servant, he was still 100% God. And he didn't abuse that in order to um, make it easy for himself. He went through trials and suffering and persecution. I mean, look at all the times they, they wanted to throw him with stones. There was one instance where they wanted to throw him off a cliff. Um, people mocked him. People laughed at him. People, he, he didn't have it easy. Um, if you go to the Old Testament and you look in the um, book of Isaiah, probably the most well-known prophecy. Isaiah made many prophecies about Jesus. I think he's the prophet in the Bible that has the most prophecies about the Messiah. But if you go and look at Isaiah 53, Isaiah tells us exactly what Jesus will endure and what he endured. Okay? For example, he said that Obviously, we all know the part where he says, "For our, uh, he was pierced for our transgressions. Um, he took our sins upon him. But what a lot of people miss in that part is also that Isaiah says that he will not be, he will not have a physical appearance in such a way that people will look at him and admire him. In other words, Jesus, when he was on earth, he looked like your ordinary run-of-the-mill um, uh, Semite man, okay? Um, it wasn't as if he was this um, a guy who was like the hunk of the month, you know, and when everyone saw him, they grasped for breath and thought, wow, this guy is so beautiful, you know, um, he was just a, he looked like an ordinary, ordinary run of the mill um, Semite man, okay? Middle Eastern man. So you would think that the king would come and he would have golden chains and he would ride on the best horses and he will have a castle and he will only speak to the important people in society, the rich people. On the contrary, Jesus rode on a donkey. Okay. His disciples were fishermen. Who did the angel appear to first? The angel appeared to Mary, yes. The angel appeared to Joseph, yes. But also the angel, when Jesus was born, the angel appeared to shepherds in the field. Do you know that in biblical times, shepherds were basically seen as the lowest on the social hierarchy they were seen as people because they didn't really have a lot of money they always um, smelled like you know field and sheep and they were not clean okay but the angel appears to them and tells them listen today a savior has been born the angel doesn't go to the rich people in their palaces to king herod and uh whoever, to, and Pontius Pilate, and tell them, listen, a Savior is born, and he's going to come on, on the most expensive horse and give you all money, and he's going to talk about money, and you're all going to drink with him and get drunk and have orgies and whatever. It's the exact opposite of all of that. Jesus had a lot of sympathy and a lot of empathy with broken-hearted people and people who were poor um, because he's, he... You, you can see that the whole time he maintained the viewpoint of many are poor in flesh. They are physically poor. They don't have clothes. They don't have fancy clothes. They don't have a lot of money. They don't have thousands of horses and camels and whatever. But spiritually they are rich. And this is exactly what we see um, with the church in Smyrna. What he says to them is, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. So the church in Smyrna understood this aspect of Jesus Christ as the suffering servant. And they understood the aspect of the first church in the book of Acts, not having much. I mean, you can read what Paul says about his journeys. 
in in the in his letters to the Corinthians, he clearly says, you know, I was shipwrecked. Um, he was basically shipwrecked, I think, for something like two days or three days. Many times he didn't have food to eat. Many times he was beaten by the authorities. He was thrown in prison. Um, he was considered to be a low life by the people in, in the society. So the same happened to, to Peter. And I mean, if you look at the way that the, the apostles died, the disciples died, um, one was hung by the neck and he was um, dragged through the streets, which is a horrible way to die. One was pierced with a spear, another was burned alive. And so we can continue, we can we can mention all their deaths. It wasn't, there's nothing romantic about it. And there's also obviously nothing romantic about being poor. But the thing is that you may have poverty physically, but in spiritually, you can be the richest person. Someone, I'm not sure who it was, but someone once said that some people are so poor all they have is money. Now that's a brilliant, that's a brilliant uh, way of illustrating how earthly riches is useless. You can talk to the richest man in the world. If he is truly honest with you, he will tell you the following. He will say to you, yes, I have millions and millions and billions of dollars in the bank. I have so many houses, I have so many vacation homes, I own farms, I own ships, I own this and I own that, and I own so many companies. But you know what? Deep inside my heart, I'm very unhappy. Once again, that instance of there's a deep dark hole inside and I can't fill it. Why? Because he doesn't know Jesus Christ. The moment you accept Jesus Christ, the moment you surrender to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you get born again, it doesn't matter how physically poor you are, but you will be happy, you will be content. It doesn't mean that you won't suffer trials and tribulations. On the contrary, I mean we read here, um, I know your afflictions and your poverty. Afflictions, poverty, trials, tribulations, suffering. The early church experienced that on a massive scale in our day and time. There are Christians in North Korea. Um, I, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to mention this detail because it's gruesome, but let me mention it. In North Korea, if you are a Christian, and they find out you're a Christian. You get a prison sentence of, I think, minimum 15 years. You go to a slave labor camp. If you are a woman, you are repeatedly raped by the camp guards, and you are forced to do hard labor. You get, if you are lucky, you get one meal a day, and that meal is hot water with a few cabbage leaves in it. And they tell you that's cabbage soup. That's all, all the food you get. You don't even get bread, meat, vegetables, anything. It's just a bit of cabbage soup that it doesn't even fill you for a few seconds. If you are a man, you are beaten brutally. You have to do forced labor. In the end, you either die of hunger or shock, or you die from internal bleeding due to all the beatings that you have to take. Or they shoot you execution style because you did something that made them angry. They caught you praying in your cell or talking to the other prisoners about the gospel or whatever. In our day and time in China, Christians in China are imprisoned for a period of three years. Um, in the Arab countries, Saudi Arabia, Iran, um, Christians, they suffer brutally. In Egypt, Christians suffer brutally. The Coptic Christian Church, they suffer. In Ethiopia, on Christmas Day, um, Christ, 25 December 2023,
Christians in Ethiopia in a certain part were holding, uh, were celebrating the birth of Christ at a certain church. Um, radical Muslim faction attacked that church with a drone. Five Christians were killed, eight got wounded. Um, in Libya, if you're a Christian, end of the line for you. The same in Sudan. The same in Eritrea. Okay. A small country which was once, I think it was once part of Ethiopia, if I'm not mistaken. The same in Somalia. There are so many countries all over the world. Yemen also. Turkey. All those countries, if they find out you're a Christian, and especially if they catch you evangelizing people, it's over. Okay. We have to pray for all our brothers and sisters all over the world. We are supposed to actually pray for them every chance we get. But people, please pray for the Christians in North Korea. Pray for Christians in China. Pray for Christians in um, Pakistan is what is a country that I forgot. Also India. People, you know, I always laugh when I hear people speak about India because people have this romantic uh, thing in their heads about India being this mystical place. It's so wonderful there and there's so many mysteries. Um, <laughs> have you seen the, the hate and intolerance that the Hindus and the Muslims have for Christians in India? There's nothing romantic about that place. It's, hor it's, it's horrible. Um, the same in Pakistan. If they, in Pakistan, uh, once again, radical Islam regime, if they catch you doing evangelize, uh, if they catch you evangelizing people, they, it's, it's over. Same in Iran, same in Saudi Arabia, all these countries. Pray for all those brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Pray for them. Think of them in your prayers. And always remember that we are actually supposed to, to think about those in prison and those who are actively being persecuted as if we ourselves are there with them. That's why Timothy, when he heard that the, the Apostle Paul got persecuted, he cried. Read the second letter to Timothy. Paul says to him, Timothy, I'm aware of your tears. And I hope that I can see you in person soon because I find joy in seeing you. Do we really find joy in our fellow believers? Do we find joy in praying for them? Do we find joy in wishing them peace and grace and mercy and the love of Jesus Christ? Or are we only self-centered? Because it's easy to call yourself a Christian in this day and time, but fall into a worldly mindset. Then you're not really born again because you just wear the label, I'm a Christian, but nothing in your deeds in your thoughts and the way you speak proves that you're a Christian. On the contrary, are you driven by worldly success and worldly prosperity or are you driven by the Holy Spirit of God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ and are you following Jesus Christ on the path of righteousness? Is He your shepherd who protects you with His rod and His staff? Or do you have another shepherd, i.e. money, sport, worldly fame, whatever the case might be? It's so easy to fall into a mindset of egoism. I'm so good, I'm so this, I'm so that. Well, bad news, Jesus said you must deny yourself. And we see with the Church of Smyrna, they had a a very strong notion of denying themselves and they understood that their focus should not be on earthly riches. That's why it tells them, your poverty, you are poor, yet you are rich. Okay? I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. You see the... <clears throat> Yes, where actually where Romans chapter uh, 11 comes in as well as certain parts of Ephesians because what happens is that the Jews 
are God's chosen people, but the thing is that a lot of them will deny Jesus and eventually they will go through the time known as Jacob's trouble. And then a faithful remnant will remain and they will see him whom they have pierced. You remember when we uh, just Revelation chapter 1, I, I mentioned it also. They will look upon him whom they have pierced and they will weep bitterly. Okay, and then they will be redeemed. Now, in the book of Ephesians, we are told that when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are actually part of Israel. Okay, it's a spiritual thing. It's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's not about are you were you born in Israel? Were you born in Jerusalem or Bethlehem or Judea or wherever? And do you have Israeli citizenship? It's nothing about that. Nothing to do with that. It's about do you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you born again? Because if you are, you are part of Israel. Okay, spiritual Israel. Now. The church in Smyrna had the problem of people who pretended to be Jews, but they were actually a synagogue of Satan. And those are the people who pretend to be Jews and they infiltrate church, churches, they infiltrated the church in Smyrna. And they had one goal, and that is to slander people and to bring, um, to bring um, basically... To, to bring uh, tension, to bring, um, yeah, what is the word? I'm thinking of the word in my mother tongue now. Now I can't come to the English word. To bring division, division. In my mother tongue of the cons, we usually say, um, twee spalt te bring. Twee spalt means literally to rip a unity in two. But that's, that's the vision. <clears throat> they infiltrate churches and they bring division. The and those two groups are fighting against each other and eventually this group starts fighting within itself and that group splits up in two, this group splits up in two, eventually it's chaos. And that's what you find in our day and, day and time in, in the majority of churches. And that's why Paul also got annoyed with the Corinthians because he told them, listen, why do you have factions? There are those of you who say, oh, I was baptized by Paul. Then they basically make make like a um, they they make like a little gang, a little faction. We are those who baptized by Paul. We're better than you. You were baptized by Silas, and those who were baptized by Silas forms their own group and say no, we were baptized and blah blah blah. And Paul tells them, listen, why are you doing this? Is the gospel about me and about Silas, or is it about Jesus Christ? We didn't die for your sins. Jesus died for your sins. He rose again. He's your Lord and Savior. We are, we are just men. And sadly, in our day and time, that is what a lot of ministers also completely forget. Because it becomes a thing of being egoistic. The people in the church like me. I'm popular. They give me money. I'm always right. Don't question me. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Now, that's verse 10. Now, always think of Jesus' um, his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 24 and 25. And what he said was that he, he mentioned all the things that will occur in the last days. You know, earthquakes, wars, famine, pestilences, persecution, everything. But then he says, when you see all these things happening, do not be afraid. And that's also what God comforts the church in Smyrna with. He tells them, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. It doesn't sound like much, but just remember, prisons in those days were a hundred times worse than prisons today. Okay? There were no toilets, there were no showers, it was dirty, there were rats everywhere. Um, everyone around you got sick. Um, the gods just beat you up for, you didn't even do anything wrong, and they beat you up just to take out their frustrations on you. So prisons in those days, uh, spending 10 days in a prison in those days were, I think those 10 days felt like 10 years. But once again, 
they find joy in their suffering. Why? Because they know they are, they have an eternal home in heaven. Okay. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. You see. Um, in this regard, let's quickly go to James chapter 2 verse 5. James chapter 2 verse 5. James chapter 2 verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has God not chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom He promised those who love Him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? James 2 verses 5 and 6. So he says that <clears throat> God actually uh, prepared the kingdom for those who are physically poor but spiritually rich. And James tells the people, listen, you are so... You are so obsessed with pleasing the people who are physically rich, but are they not the ones who drag you before courts, who persecute you? And that's the truth. And he says, listen, when they persecute you, we can get back to what John is writing to the church in Smyrna now. He says, when they persecute you, be faithful, even to the point of death. Even if you sit there in prison and they tell you, listen, tomorrow you're getting executed. We're going to behead you or hang you then don't lose hope. Actually, then you should rejoice because when you die, you know exactly where you're going. You're going to be with Jesus Christ. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. You Basically, you will rule alongside Jesus in the new Jerusalem. That's actually what he's saying. Isn't that amazing? Whoever has ears, the final verse, in the letter to the church of Smyrna, Revelation 2, 2 verse 11. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. We all know the second death, um, this is another promise, and, and this obviously relates to the promise of having um, the life as a victor's crown. The second death, those who will have the second death, is those who will die physically but also die spiritually the um, spirit will be will end up in hell it's those who deny jesus christ up unto the end they will go through the second death and the second death is in an eternal death okay we can die a physical death which is the first death but we will not see the second death because we have life in abundance in jesus christ and we will have the crown of life and that is our victor's crown. All right. So I'm just going to end this video um, for us with a prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we praise and we glorify your holy name. You are the one who said to Moses, I am that I am. You also said to the prophet Isaiah that you are the only rock and apart from you there is no other. Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we know that you are the only rock, you are the only true God, the only true creator of heaven and earth. Lord, thank you for your word, the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. Thank you for the cross on which the blood of Jesus Christ was shed. Thank you for the wounds that he received with which he healed us. Lord, we thank you for his resurrection and his ascension. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who works as a guide, a comforter and a protector in our lives. Lord, we thank you and we ask that you cleanse us in body, spirit and mind. And Lord, we ask you that you will cleanse our thoughts and our speech and our physical deeds so that we will glorify you in everything that we think, say and do. Lord, please help us to have the spiritual armor, the armor of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith and the word 
as the sword, the sword of the Spirit. Lord, we thank you for all our fellow brothers and sisters all over the world. Please help those who are facing dreadful persecution, Lord. Bless them and protect them, be with them. Lord, please help us in these days where we are on the brink of the Great Tribulation. Please help us to endure to the very end and to find joy in suffering, Lord, because we know that death cannot hold us. Because Jesus Christ has conquered death. And like the Apostle Paul, we can say, Death, where is thy victory? Death, where is thy sting? And we will be with Jesus Christ in the new Jerusalem. Lord, we thank you and we praise you and you, we glorify your name unto all eternity. In the name of the Father, the Son of, and the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Okay, greetings, brothers and sisters. Um, this is the video that I'm doing on the third letter written to the churches in Revelation. Now, that is the letter to Pergamum, okay? So, um, the letter to Pergamum. Let me just get everything open here, my notes, and the piece that I need to read. Okay, so we've looked at the letter to Ephesus, then we looked at the letter to the church in Smyrna, and now we are going to look at the letter to the church in Pergamum. Now, um, if you hear noise in the background, please just excuse it. It's um, my neighbor has, um, what do you call them, macaws. And they are in their cage outside and they're making quite a noise. So please excuse that. He's got something like, I think, seven or eight different types of parrots. So please excuse the noise in the background. <clears throat> um, the church in Pergamum, the letter to the church in Pergamum is Revelation 2. And um, that is from verse 12 to verse 17. Okay. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. Okay. Now, the, every time in the word of God when you hear about a sharp double-edged sword, then you should think of uh, Hebrews 4 verse 12 that tells you about the word of God that is sharper than any two-edged sword. And you should also think about Revelation chapter 19 where it is said that the um, Jesus has the uh, as a sword, okay, and then together with that we read in Ephesians six we we read as part of the spiritual armor, as part of the armor of God. Um, one of the pieces is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, because the word of God is the way in which we counter attack. We block attacks with our faith, having faith in the Lord. That's how we counter the enemy. Um, that's how we defend ourselves against the enemy. And then launching counterattacks with the sword, sword of the Spirit, uh, which is the Word of God. So quoting scripture. The moment, you, the moment Satan attacks you and you quote scripture, you are confronting him with the truth of God. Okay, that's what Jesus also did in Matthew chapter 4, when Satan tempted him in the wilderness. Satan quoted scripture, but he quoted it out of context. Jesus quotes scripture within context, okay? So, we should all, all always be vigilant and ask the Lord for discernment by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit so that we can distinguish between scripture being quoted in context and scripture being quoted out of context, okay? Because the moment you have scripture out of context, then it becomes a pretext for false teaching. Okay. These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. So the one who has the sharp double-edged sword is Jesus, because Jesus is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Okay. Now, this is very important. The church in Pergamum, there was a throne of Satan constructed there. It was a physical throne. But you would be wrong in separating the physical from the spiritual here, okay? 
It's a physical throne that was constructed there. It was to honor the god known as Zeus. All right. Now, Zeus was also known as Jupiter. Interestingly enough, if you go deep into the New Age and you um, lend your ears out to false uh, New Age um, people like David Icke, uh, Jordan Maxwell, um, who's that other guy? He's passed away long ago, but he got like a little grey beard and he's got quite long hair. He, uh, David Icke was influenced by him a lot. I can't remember his name. And also Alice Bailey and all those. Um, and I'm pretty sure Elena Blavatsky teaches the same. But they will tell you that Zeus, also known as Jupiter, is actually Jesus. That's the lie that they tell you. So... You see the confusion this brings. If you don't have discernment, if you're not a born-again Christian who don't have the discernment of the Holy Spirit, then obviously you'll think, okay, Christianity is just another fake religion. Um, they basically borrowed from mythology and, you know, there's no point in following it. So the fact that Zeus is also Jupiter and Jupiter is, uh, the lie is told in the New Age that Jupiter is Jesus, um, is very significant here because remember what we are dealing with. Throughout Revelation, we are dealing with an upbuilding and an upbuilding and an upbuilding to a certain climax where the Antichrist appears on the earth and he has the false prophet. And then we go on, we go on, and, and then we reach the ultimate climax where Jesus Christ comes back. And he destroys Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And they are all thrown into the lake of fire along with all their followers and their kingdom and everything. Okay? So, uh, the, the throne of Satan was actually the throne of Zeus. Alright? But the Bible doesn't mince any words. The Bible calls it what it is. It says it's the throne of Satan. Now, what I want you to pay attention to here is... Um, in September 2023, I think it was on the 23rd of September 2023, I wrote an article on Facebook and it was titled Throne of Destruction. Um, I will put the link to the article on Facebook uh, in the description of this video for those who want to go and read it. But what, what it basically comes down to is the throne of Satan is the key construct in this regard. Because the throne of Satan is a counterfeit throne that is a counterfeit of the throne of David on which Jesus Christ as the Messiah will be seated in the New Jerusalem. Remember that Satan as a fallen cherub cannot create anything. The only thing he can do is he can imitate. In other words, he can create counterfeits. And the second thing he can do very well is he can destroy so imitation and destruction, those are his specialties. Okay. Now, if you go to um, Psalm 94, Psalm 94, in Psalm 94, we see the following. Um, they talk about God who avenges. They talk about the wicked and the wicked get what they deserve. They get what they deserve. And then in verse 20, they talk about a throne. Now, different translations translate verse 20 differently. The throne, um, the, the Bible I have here says, Can a corrupt throne be allied with you? A throne that brings on misery by its decrees. Now, the King James Version, um, if I'm not mistaken, translates it as a throne of iniquity. Um, other translations, I think the Revised Version of 1885 translates it as a throne of wickedness or something like that. But the, the um, translation that translates it the best is the LEB, the Lexham English Bible. The Lexham English Bible, along with the literal standard version, are amongst the most literal Bible translations that you will get. 
Um, not always easy to read, but it's very literally translated. Even more, it's considered more literal than the New American Standard Bible. Um, the Lexham English Bible says in verse 20, Can a throne of destruction be allied with you? So, in the Lexham English Bible, it talks, it, it um, calls the throne of Satan the throne of destruction. You can call it the throne of destruction, you can call it the throne of iniquity, the throne of wickedness, the throne of corruption. But for me personally, throne of destruction, as the Lexham English Bible translates it, is very significant because that's what the empire of darkness, the Antichrist empire of the end times, will flourish on. And the thing is, they won't do it very blatantly. It won't be destruction on a blatant, um, easy to see basis. It will be destruction sometimes blatantly but most of the times indirectly and most and majority of the time it will be subtle it, it will be done very cleverly and very subtly and those who don't have discernment won't be able to see through it that's why jesus also said if if i did not if god the father did not um make the time shorter if, they, if he did not shorten the days, then even the elect would be deceived. So that's how clever the schemes of the kingdom of darkness will be. Please note, I'm not giving them any credit, but I'm just saying, um, they, they have already lost the battle, but Revelation 12 verse 12 tells us that the Satan has, fought, has come down to the earth and he's angry. Okay? Because he knows his time is short. He knows it's a short time before Jesus will return. <clears throat> so he wants to sow as much destruction as he can in this time. And that's why he does it in a very clever way, very crafty way, and so on. So I'm not giving him any credit or the Antichrist any credit or anything. I'm just saying that they are not stupid. Okay? If you think they're stupid, then you clearly... Um, underestimating them okay don't underestimate the enemy know that the enemy um, has already lost but don't underestimate them okay don't uh, don't think that uh, we don't need to know anything about them or so on okay <clears throat> now he says where the throne of satan is now this is like a throne of destruction which is, which is a counterfeit throne of the throne of david You'll see in Psalm 46, Psalm 46, verse 4 to 5, it talks about a city which, where the rivers, the streams, make glad. Okay? In Ezekiel 47, verses 1 to 12, and also in Revelation 22, you'll see that it talks about the throne of God, and it talks about... Um, the New Jerusalem, and it says that streams of living water flows forth from the city. And it flows into the sea, and it makes the salt water fresh water. So the living water, which is the Holy Spirit, brings life. Now you can just imagine, if Satan uh, puts a, constructs a counterfeit throne, then what will flow forth from that throne? A river of death. Death, destruction, and so on. If you do a, a, a study on Satan from a Christian perspective and you go and look at the research of, of Derek Gilbert, then you'll see in Derek Gilbert, Gilbert's research, um, he makes a very good case for Satan. Actually, his, his real name is Baal. Okay? Um, in the Old Testament, he's called Baal. Baal and Satan is the same entity. The Catholic Church teaches that Baal is one of the crown princes of hell that's below Satan. And that's not true. Satan is not a name, it's a job description. It means adversary or, um, adversary or um, accuser. Okay? So his name... Satan is his title, but his name, according to the research of Derek Gilbert, is Baal. All right. Now, <clears throat> Baal 
construct a counterfeit throne. Why exactly a counterfeit throne? It's a counterfeit throne on which the Antichrist will be seated and he will sit in the house of God. What does the Apostle Paul tell us in his letters to the Thessalonians? He says, he will sit in the house of God and he will pretend to be God. So he will sit on a throne of destruction also and pretend that he is this uh, beneficial world leader. And he will do wonderful things. We know that the book of Revelation is very clear about that. He will do wonderful things, the Antichrist, and people will think, oh my goodness, this is the man. This, this is the guy, you know, this is the guy that we've been waiting for, but he's a false messiah. Okay, that's the sad part of it. So many will fall for the, for the, the, the poison that drips from the tongue of the false messiah, the Antichrist. Okay, and he's actually so insignificant. He's powerful, but at the same time so insignificant in the sense that he cannot fight directly against Jesus. Because Paul also tells us that when Jesus appears as the lion of the tribe of Judah with his second coming, what will he do? He will destroy the Antichrist with what? With the breath of his mouth. The breath of his mouth is the Neshema, it's the life-giving force. It's the breath of life that God also breathed into human beings at creation. Okay, go look at Genesis 2 verse 7. It said he formed man from the, from the dirt of the ground and he blew the breath of life. In Hebrew that is Neshema. Now the life that Jesus gives is so magnificently strong that by the mere breath of his mouth which breathes the breath of life he will destroy the Antichrist. That's how almighty Jesus is. We can't comprehend it with our human understanding. Okay. Um, note also in the letter to Pergamum, he says to them, okay, there's the throne of, um, the throne of Satan is there, but despite the throne of Satan being there, the throne of destruction, the throne of Zeus, okay, despite it being there, he said, you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Antipas was a Christian martyr who was murdered in Pergamum because um, he refused to renounce Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold on to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. You see, the problem is the moment you eat food sacrificed to idols and you didn't pray beforehand and ask God to cleanse the food, then um, remember that you are actually partaking in the practices of darkness. Okay? And obviously sexual immorality, we know that the Bible is very clear on that. Okay, likewise you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now the Nicolaitans, I've mentioned them before, they were a sect who um, taught, basically taught Gnosticism. Now Gnosticism, the key principle of Gnosticism, and it's interesting that the New Age teachings of David Ike, Jordan Maxwell and others also flourishes on Gnosticism. Gnosticism says that knowledge is above everything. But what does Colossians 2 verse 3 teach us? What does Colossians 2 verse 3 say about knowledge? Let's go and look at Colossians 2 verse 3. You know, when I'm studying by myself at home and I have to find a verse, then I find it easily. But when I have to find it quickly in front of people, then I'm, I'm not so good at it. <laughs> anyway, uh, Colossians 2 verses 2 and 3. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, now listen very carefully to verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 
So according to the Bible, the Lord says my people perishes due to lack of knowledge. Gnostics will usually quote that verse out of context and tell you, you see, knowledge is important, but you don't get saved due to knowledge. You can know the whole Bible from front to end. You can memorize it and, um, you know, quote it fr from, from memory. But if you don't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, obviously you are lost. So knowledge, the Bible says knowledge is good, but it is knowledge and wisdom that is found in Jesus Christ. Not any other wisdom or knowledge. Not the wisdom of the New Age, the knowledge of the New Age, the knowledge of Gnosticism, whatever, um, the Gnost knowledge found in Eastern mysticism or um whatever okay it's knowledge the, the the knowledge and wisdom hidden as treasures in jesus christ that's the knowledge and the wisdom that people need to have and that's why god the father said in the old testament to Hosea, my my people perish for lack of knowledge what he meant was they don't have enough knowledge of me their spiritual knowledge is pathetic they think they can be rescued by worldly wisdom. You see? So, in other words, the Nicolaitans were a cult that said, as long as you have earthly wisdom and you have earthly um, knowledge of things, then you're okay. Okay? That's typically what New Age teachers like, especially Jordan Maxwell, will also tell you. Knowledge is important. Okay, and the problem with earthly knowledge is it causes you to be puffed up, it causes you to be prideful. And pride was one of the main reasons why Satan was cast out of heaven. Remember, he was a cherub first, and that's also why he creates a counterfeit throne the throne of Satan, the throne of destruction, the throne of iniquity, the throne of wickedness, whatever you want to call it. In Pergamum because he was one of the cherubs that was next to the throne of God he was in the vicinity of the throne of God so he had time to study the throne of God and go and look at his I will statements in Isaiah um, 14 I think it's verses 12 to 14 one of his I will, st I will statements is I will um, ascend above the throne of God. That's another way of saying, I will create a counterfeit throne that looks like the throne of God, and I will tell people, don't look at the throne of God, look at this throne. Look at me. I will give you everything. And sadly, a lot of people will fall for that. The problem with Gnosticism is, it ends up in a, a reverence of the self. Me, myself, I. And that's, that is what ties it uh, indirectly with the, the philosophy of Satan. And that's also what you find in Satanism. Okay, they worship Satan, but it comes to a point where Satan tells you, listen, you worship me, but I will make you your own God. You are a God. Now, this relates to um, the teachings of uh, uh, of obscure occult groups like Fraternitas Saturni. Fraternitas Saturni is a German occult group, um, one of the most secretive groups in the world. Um, Fraternitas Saturni means the brotherhood of Saturn. Okay, and um, they say that when you join them, you are vibrating in a lower octave, and then they see that as the lower plane of the planet Saturn. And they say the more knowledge you gain, the more the higher you ascend, and then you ascend to the level of the higher octave, and then you vibrate in a higher octave, in a higher frequency. And they call the lower frequency Satan, and they call the higher frequency Lucifer, the light bringer, because then you have the light of knowledge, which is obviously a counterfeit light. It's a light with which Satan is counterfeit. He's, he's, he created, he, he, um, he imitates the light of Christ. Okay, He imitates Christ as the light of the world. He imitates the word of God as the light that drives away the darkness. 
He creates a counterfeit light, a false light. Okay. He imitates the light by producing a false light. And he's trying to tell people this is the true light. And it's it's tragic how many people fall for that lie. It's absolutely horrifying. Um, in pagan mythology, in the occult and so on, they will tell you that Zeus displaced Saturn because Saturn was the demiurge who presided over the Golden Age. Now, the Golden Age, as the pagans call it, was the time before the flood. When the watchers came down, they had sexual relations with the women, the Nephilim, the giants were born, and there was chaos and destruction on the earth. The pagans see that as a golden age. For them, it was something wonderful. They have this very romantic idea about it. And according to them, Saturn will return, displace Zeus, and then he will bring back a golden age. And they, they refer to it as the second coming of Saturn. If you want to know more about this, uh, take a look at Derek Gilbert's book, The Second Coming of Saturn. Okay? But you can see how they play around. They will tell you, if you tell them, but listen, I believe in Jesus, then they will tell you, no, 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 no. You know, the church has lied to you. Everybody has lied to you. The ministers, everyone, the Bible lies to you. Jesus is actually Jupiter. And Zeus is um, the demiurge who created everything. But he will come back and um, he will displace Zeus. And he will bring us another golden age. And that is, that golden age of which they are referring to, which they are waiting for, is basically the new world order. Okay, that's when the Antichrist will reign in full swing. And they have this very romantic idea about it. The pagan religions and the occult and new age and what, uh, all of them. Okay. So you have the throne of Satan, the throne of iniquity, the throne of destruction. It is a throne of lies from which a river of death flows forth. Okay. And that is why Jerusalem, um, in the time of the prophet Zephaniah, Jerusalem was called the city that is soiled, defiled, and oppressing. Being soiled is being morally corrupt. Being defiled means you are so morally corrupt that you praise the lie and you hate the truth. Exactly what the prophet Isaiah warned the people against. And then obviously oppressing, oppressing people. And that's exactly what we will see when the Antichrist is seated on the throne of destruction, the throne of Satan. Okay. Um, does it mean that in our day and time the Antichrist will be seated physically in, in Turkey? Um, because remember Pergamum was one of the seven churches in Turkey, as it was called in those days Asia Minor. Not necessarily, but remember the, the, the key thing here. The key thing is remembering that the Antichrist will have a counterfeit throne, the throne of Satan or the throne of destruction. And he will be seated on it and he will pretend to be God. And he will do it so cleverly that even the elect will be this, would have been deceived if the Lord did not shorten the days. It's, it's, um, it's hectic stuff. It's not for the faint of heart. But, you know, if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, obviously you will not make it. Jesus was very clear when he said that those who endure until the end, I will save them. I, we will be with him in the new Jerusalem. People, this is why in our day and time you need to stay on your knees. You need to stay with your face in the Word of God. You stick your nose in the Word of God. Study it. Ask the Holy Spirit for discernment. Walk with Jesus. Live out the armor of God. Now, importantly, in Revelation 2 verse 16, he says, Repent therefore. What will happen if they don't repent? He says, Otherwise, if you don't repent, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The sword of my mouth is 
the word of God. So Jesus says, listen, if you don't repent, I will count you, you uh, church in Pergamum, I will count you among the evildoers, and I will destroy you along with the evildoers with the word of my mouth. I will destroy them with the word of my mouth, the word of God. In other words, I will destroy them with the truth. Because the forces of darkness hate and despise truth so much that when Jesus, as the truth of God, stands before them, they will crumble and he will destroy them with the breath of his mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's significant that he says that because he's basically saying, don't lend out your ears to false teachings. Don't lend out your ears to the words of the false prophets. Don't lend out your ears to the one seated on the throne of iniquity, the one seated on the throne of Satan. To the one who is victorious, in other words, the one who endures to the end, who refuses to deny Jesus Christ, I will give some of the hidden manna. And here's an interesting part. It's interesting how he ends this. He says, I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. What's interesting here is that, you know, when Jesus comes with his second coming, he also has a name uh, written on him. He tells us in Revelation 19, he has a name written on him that only he knows. Okay. When those who endure to the end, we will each be given a, a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Now what's interesting here is a Greek philosophy, ancient Greek philosophy, deceived the world. Okay, Just as the pagan ancient Greek mythology, the, you know, because it's actually all, it's, 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 a, it's a reverence of the Nephilim, those gods that they revered or fallen angels, Nephilim, and so on, okay? The Titans, and all those. In Greek philosophy, there's a concept, I think it was Aristotle that thought of that concept, it's called the tabula rasa. Tabula rasa means the clean table, the clean slate, the white slate. And he says that each person is like a white slate, and you should basically write your life story on the white slate. Jesus says, no, I will give you a white stone and on it will be written a name that only you know. Jesus is saying, I will give you a unique identity. I will renew you. You will receive a new body, a new mind, a new... You will be renewed. You will be reju rejuvenated with a long, with a holy secret name that only you will know and once again it's one of those things that with our human understanding we can't grasp it because it's so wonderful once again it is like paul says i think it's in romans chapter 8 he says that um nothing we cannot comprehend in any way i'm paraphrasing now but he, it comes down to he says we cannot comprehend in any way the things that God plans for us when we are when we leave this world and we go to <clears throat> the eternal life. We cannot comprehend the life that we will have in the New Jerusalem. We cannot comprehend the wonderfulness, the, the peace, the um the blessed peace, the blessed calmness, the wonderful atmosphere. In the new Jerusalem. We, we can't comprehend it. Let me finish for us with a prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit, Lord, and we praise and we glorify your name. You are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lord, we praise your name, Lord. You are the one worthy to receive praise we thank you for jesus we thank you for his crucifixion we thank you for his resurrection and his ascension lord we thank you for the holy spirit who works as guide comfort and protector in our lives 
Lord, please help us to keep our spiritual eyes open and our spiritual ears open, that we will not be deceived, Lord. Please help us. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. Lord, we ask that you bless our minds, bless our bodies, bless our souls. Lord, and help us that our thoughts, our deeds, and our words will be to the glory of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Lord, help us to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross daily and follow you daily, Lord. Lord, we ask that any attacks from the forces of darkness, that you will ward them off, that you will hit the forces of darkness with blindness, with, mute, with muteness and deaf, deafness, Lord, that they will not be able to speak lies into our minds, into our thoughts, that they will not be able to attack us, Lord. And help us that we will live your word, not only study it, but make it part of our everyday life, Lord. Because we know that your word is the sharp double-edged sword. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it is a discerner of the thoughts. Lord, we praise and we glorify you. We cannot thank you enough for your love, your mercy, your grace, your patience, your righteousness. And thank you for every time that when we fall into error, that you correct, uh, correct us. Lord, thank you for your correction. We pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Greetings, brothers and sisters. So, um, we are continuing with our study on the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. And this time we are going to look at the message or the letter to Thyatira. I first had to go on Google and find out how you need to pronounce the name Thyatira because in my mother tongue Afrikaans, which is a derivative of Dutch, we say uh, Thyatira or Thyatira. But obviously it's pronounced different, differently in English, so apparently it's pronounced Thyatira. Okay? So Thyatira. Now that is Revelation chapter 2. From verse 18 to verse 28. Alright. So let's look. Let's look at what they, what they tell us there. Um, Jesus Christ is saying to John. Uh, from verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira. Write. These are the words of the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Okay, now let's, <coughs> let's look at that description for a moment, the description of Jesus. In this context, he is described as one who has eyes like a flame of fire. We know that that is also how John saw him in his vision in Revelation chapter 1. Eyes like a flame of fire. Now remember what Jesus said to his disciples when he did his ministry on earth. He told them that um, there's a light inside of you, okay? You are the light of the world because Jesus Christ is actually the light of the world. We know that's one of his seven I am statements and he makes that statement in uh, John chapter 8 verse 12. But also he said to the people that you are uh, the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. So that implies that we should shine the light of Jesus Christ in this dark world. And the only way we can do that is by um, doing the Great Commission. Um, you know, uh, going out and teaching the gospel to people and by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, eyes, uh, there's an old saying, eyes are the windows to the soul, okay? So if your eyes are accustomed to light, then you will put 
those things which are the things of light, you're going to put that in front of your eyes. In Psalm, I can't remember now if it's Psalm 101 or Psalm 103, um, but in the third verse, David writes that I will put no wicked thing before my eyes. Um, which means that what you put in front of you in what you put in front of your eyes is the things that will feed your soul so if you look at pornography and you um, glorify in the portrayal of senseless violence and these things then obviously that's what you're feeding your soul with because that's what you are taking in through your eyes okay so jesus has eyes like a flame of fire that means that he is basically portraying the fire of God. Remember in the um, epistle to the Hebrews, I think it's the final verse in Hebrews 12. It says that our God is a consuming fire. We also know that when God appeared to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, um, we made his statement, I am that I am, Exodus 3 verse 14. Moses saw the bush and the bush was burning, but the fire didn't consume the bush. Okay, so this is a spiritual fire. All right. And the spiritual fire of God is one of the ways in which the Holy Spirit of God manifests himself. The Holy Spirit can manifest as a fire of God. The Holy Spirit can manifest as the living water that flows from the throne um, in the New Jerusalem and that makes the salt water fresh. The Holy Spirit can also um, manifest as the wind of God. Okay, that's when you when you read Genesis 1, that's the way the Holy Spirit is portrayed in the original text, where it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. Um, it actually says in the original text, the wind of God, okay, the wind of Elohim. So the Holy Spirit can also manifest as wind, okay. Um, we know that at the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit also manifested as tongues of fire that came down on the people and they started uh, speaking in different languages, okay. And there were a lot of people present there, they were uh, people from Cretensia, they were Arabs, they were all kinds of people. And each of them said, but we are hearing these people speak in our languages. And then later on, they, they realized that, but listen, this is what happens. This is part of the Great Commission. The Holy Spirit is coming down on people and they are basically um, going to preach the gospel. That's the way they preach the gospel in, in all of the world. When you speak to missionaries who go to other countries, um, these missionaries will tell you that sometimes um, they will, for example, go to China, okay? And their mother tongue is English, but they can't speak a single word of Mandarin or traditional Chinese or anything. But then when they get to a village somewhere, they suddenly, one of them, break out in... Um, in 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 a basically in a you know they they have the fire of God suddenly and they start speaking Mandarin fluently. That is a manifestation of the way in which the Holy Spirit causes people to sometimes speak in tongues. Okay, so the modern phenomena which you see in a lot of um, hyper charismatic churches where people have these blabber senseless blabber that nobody understands that's not speaking in tongues speaking in tongues in this sense means that um, when it comes to the great commission it means that when you for example speak to a group of arab people palestinians or you speak to a group of chinese people or people somewhere in northern africa and you suddenly start speaking their language and you explain the gospel to them and you afterwards you think to yourself how on earth did I manage to suddenly speak their language for those few minutes then that was the Holy Spirit basically speaking through you okay the tongues of fire now Jesus has eyes like a flame of fire so through the eyes of Jesus you can see the Holy Spirit 
because the Holy Spirit always points to Jesus and Jesus always points to God the Father. All right. And pay close attention to the other description that they give. They say that um, Jesus has feet that are like burnished bronze. In the book of Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream about a massive um, statue, when Daniel um, interpreted the dream, Daniel said that this statue is very strong, but the feet are made of clay. Now, that became a saying in many languages uh, where you say someone has feet of clay. That means that they can be as strong as they are. But if they have feet of clay, the moment they, the clay crumbles and they fall over, they mean nothing. And that's typically what you see with the Antichrist. Because remember that Nebuchadnezzar is one of the foreshadowings of the Antichrist of Revelation chapter 13. Okay, The foreshadowings that we see in the Bible of the Antichrist are uh, Nimrod, um, also Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Pharaoh of Egypt, um, King Herod in, in the time when Jesus was born who slaughtered the, um, the babies. Um, also, uh, one of the best foreshadowings of the Antichrist, one of the most prominent foreshadowings of the Antichrist is Judas Iscariot. Okay, So, the Antichrist and the symbolism related to the Antichrist is that he is a statue, he is a powerful ruler, but he has feet of clay. Jesus, on the other hand, has feet that are like burnished bronze. Because Jesus is the truth of God, and the truth of God is steadfast, and it is the rock on which we build. Okay, the Apostle Paul uh, regularly writes about that, okay, in his epistles. And he also told the Corinthians that, um, you know, I we lay a foundation, and the foundation is Christ, and um, we need to build on that foundation, okay? If your foundation obviously is not Jesus Christ, then you are building on something else. Then you are building on a false Messiah and then your spiritual house is going to crumble. It's the same thing that Jesus said in um, Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 to 27 when he said that um, those who listen to me and who heed my words are like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And when the storm came, it could not destroy the house. Okay, but the man who doesn't listen to Jesus and who doesn't heed the words of Jesus are like a man who built his house on sand. And when the storm comes, the storm completely destroys the house. Okay. Now, Jesus, as the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, with eyes like flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze, he says the following to the church at um, Thyatira. Okay, he says, I know your works, your love, faith, service, and patient endurance. Okay, I know your works, your love, faith, service, and patient endurance. I know that your last works are greater than the first. In other words, these are people who are basically growing in their faith. And their faith is so steadfast that their faith leads them to do good works. Now, obviously, we know you don't get um, saved by good works. You get saved by faith. But faith without works is dead. That's what the epistle of James clearly tells us. Okay. Then he says in verse 20, But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice fornication and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Now that's a verse that we can stand still for, for a long time. What does he mean when he says that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice fornication and to eat food sacrificed to idols? To understand Jezebel, you have to go back to the Old Testament, uh, to the days of Elijah, okay? The days of Elijah and uh, 
um, the time when King Ahab ruled over Israel. That's what I forgot to mention earlier. Ahab is also one of the um, foreshadowings of the Antichrist of Revelation chapter 13. So if we go to 1 Kings, you'll see that in the days of Elijah, there was a drought. And the reason why there was a drought, remember that when it rains, um, rain is symbolic of God pouring out His blessing upon people. Because when it rains, you can cultivate the fields and things grow. Okay, But when there's a drought, it's basically God saying, listen, you are practicing idolatry and I'm taking back my provision. Now, in the time of Elijah, we know in 1 Kings 17, Elijah predicts a drought. And the drought lasted for about three and a half years, more or less. Okay. Then Elijah went to the widow. There's obviously a lot of symbolism in that. Um, I'll do a video someday about that, about the symbolism um, of Elijah and the widow of um, Zarephath. And then he revives the widow's son. And then later on, Elijah faces off against the prophets of Baal. Now remember in the, in the days of King Ahab, King Ahab basically was the head of the cult of Baal and his wife Jezebel was head of the cult of Asherah. Okay, Asherah is the same as Inanna. She's the same as Ishtar. Um, she's basically the queen of heaven that the prophet Jeremiah warned the people against. All right. Now, we know that Elijah um, triumphed over the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel. And then the drought initially ended. And then in 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah flees from Jezebel. Why? Because Jezebel persecuted the prophets of God. Okay. Now, what did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 24 and 25? When he talked about the, the end times, he said, listen, in those days there will be persecution and you must flee to the mountains. Now, what we see happening in the days of Elijah is basically a foreshadowing of what is to come for us during the Great Tribulation also. Okay, um, In the days of Elijah, prophets of God had to flee to the mountains and they, they had to hide in caves. And Elijah and Obadiah were two prophets who looked after those prophets who, who um, were hidden in the caves. Um, Jezebel is a type of the great harlot. She's a typology of the great harlot who rides on the beast in Revelation chapter 13. Okay. So she rides on the beast and she infiltrates the churches of God with witchcraft, general New Age te teachings. That's what we see in our day and time. So many churches are infiltrated by New Age teachings. You know the whole um, law of attraction nonsense that actually comes from the occult philosophy of Elena Blavatsky. Okay, where you have the spirit of Jezebel, you have women who are. Um, they have uh, dominance over males. They basically rule the assembly. Um, what they also do is they use manipulation. They manipulate people into doing things. Where you have the spirit of Jezebel, you, you also have adultery. You have general sexual promiscuity in the church. Where you have the spirit of Jezebel, you have witchcraft practices that goes hand in hand with um, soothsaying um, and all kinds of new age practices. So usually where you see um, people doing prophecies and they only prophesy um, the prosperity you know, and where you have the prosperity gospel. Many times where you have the prosperity gospel and you have preachers and 
servants in the church who prophesy, but the only thing they prophesy about is prosperity. They tell you things like, ignore the book of Revelation. That's what um, the, the author of the, what's that book called? Um, the Purpose Driven Life. Um, Jacob Prash refers to it as the Purpose Driven Lie. The author of The Purpose Driven Life, um, Rick Warren, that's what he does. He tells Christians, don't focus on the book of Revelation. Don't take any heed of, to, don't give heed to biblical prophecy. Don't focus on the end times. That's basically what he's saying. And if you go and you read the major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, you'll see that in their time, this was an abomination to the Lord because there were prophets in the temples who told the people, listen, there won't come any hard times. You will only have prosperity. You will only have good times. And the Lord, through prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, spoke against those false prophets. He called them false prophets because that's what these people did. And that's what you also see in our day and time in churches that's infiltrated by the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of the great harlot. Okay. Now, um, if you go on further, you'll see that Elijah had to flee from Jezebel because she were persecuted. She were trying to kill him. And then later on, when you come to 1 Kings uh, chapter 21, that's what I want us to focus on as a, as, as a text that basically forms a parallel with what we read um, in Revelation chapter 2 concerning the letter to Thyatira. Okay, now 1 Kings chapter 21 is about Nabal's vineyard. Okay, now I will read this for us. Later following events took place. Nabot the Jezreelite had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of King Ahab of Samaria. And Ahab said to Nabot, Give me your vineyard so that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near my house. I will give you a better vineyard for it, or if it seems good to you, I will give you its value in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give you my ancestral inheritance. So Ahab sees the wonderful vineyard that um, Naboth has, and he says, Listen, give me your vineyard. I'll give you a better vineyard, or I can give you money <clears throat> in exchange for the vineyard. But Naboth says no. Um, and it's his right to say no, because it's a vineyard that he has inherited. Okay? It's his. It's his property. He can say no if he wants to. Now, look at the reaction of Ahab. He, he basically acts like a child. If he doesn't get his way, he's like a child that throws a tantrum. Ahab went home resentful and sullen because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him. For he said, I will not give you my ancestral inheritance. Now Ahab lay down on his bed, turned away his face and would not eat. This is the type of um, behavior that you will also see in the end times of the Antichrist. You either do what he says, and if you don't do what he says, he's like a little child throwing a tantrum, and he will send his wrath upon you, and he will destroy you. Look what happens now. His wife Jezebel came to him and said, Why are you so depressed that you will not eat? He said to her, because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite, and I said to him, give me your vineyard for money, or else, if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard for it. But he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Now look at what Jezebel does. His wife Jezebel said to him, do you now govern Israel? Get up, eat some food, and be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters to Ahab in Ahab's name. So what, what is she doing here? We already see manipulation. She's manipulating him. We already see fraud because she now writes letters in the name of Ahab, pretending that she's Ahab. Okay. So we see manipulation and we see f uh, fraud, fraudulent behavior. 
She wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. That was a crime in those days. You couldn't just use the king's seal on letters as you wanted to. You had to have his permission. But you see, she's manipulating him. Once again, the spirit of Jezebel, manipulation. We see manipulation and along with that we see fraud. She sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who lived with Naboth in his city. She wrote in the letters, now listen carefully, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth at the head of the assembly. Seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them bring a charge against him, saying, You have cursed God and the king. We know that the word of God is very clear about bringing false witness against someone. God absolutely resents that. So she's, she's manipulating, she's, she's being manipulative, she's committing fraud, now she's bringing false witness against the man. Then take him out and stone him to death. My goodness. Murder. Conspiracy to commit murder. The men of his city, the elders and the nobles who lived in his city, did as Jezebel had sent word to them, just as it was written in the letters that she had sent to them. They proclaimed a fast, seated Naboth at the head of the assembly. The two scoundrels came in and sat opposite him. And the scoundrels brought a charge against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth cursed God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned, he is dead. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Go, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. As soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab set out to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Now, what is the symbol of a vineyard in the Bible? The symbology of a vineyard is the following. A vineyard is basically the assembly of believers. A vineyard is the church. What grows in the vineyard? Grapes grow there. What did Jesus say in John chapter 15? He said, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Naboth was a man who we don't know much about him, but from what we can deduce from the text, Naboth was an honest man who did what he did. He had a vineyard, and um, I take it this vineyard were very cared very well for. He looked after it very well, and it was so beautiful that the king wanted this vineyard. Jezebel taking the vineyard from Naboth is a typology of how the spirit of Jezebel will infiltrate churches and will bring witchcraft into churches. And that's what happened with the church of Thyatira. Okay? They were infiltrated by the spirit of Jezebel. And what happened there? Sexual immorality, false prophecies. In the Old Testament, false prophecies were seen as such a crime that if you prophesied falsely and you said, this is what God says, and you didn't prophesy and you prophesied falsely and you were caught out, you were basically stoned to death. Now, I'm not saying we should stone people to death, but what I am saying is that is how God, that is how great uh, a sin it is, how great an ab abomination it is in the eyes of the Lord. When you prophesy falsely, Jezebel flourishes on false prophecies. And she wants to sing a lullaby to the people and say, oh, it's okay. You know, do what you do. Prosperity, your best life now, you know. You'll get rich. And if you can't get possession of something, I will give it to you. Even if I have to commit fraud, even if I have to manipulate people, even if I have to, to commit conspiracy to commit murder, even if I have to commit murder, even if I have to bring false witness against people. All the things that the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob uh, totally hates. If I have to go that far, I'll do it. As long as you are happy. 
And as long as you don't speak the truth. And what do we see in churches in our day and time? They don't want to talk about repentance. A lot of them hate the truth of God. They don't want to speak about repentance. They don't want to speak about the reality of heaven and hell. They don't want to tell you about spiritual warfare. To them, it's just your best life now. You know, you'll get rich. The Lord wants you to become rich. Prosperity. Prosperity left, right and center. It's the spirit of Jezebel. It's not the Holy Spirit. Back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 21. Now he says the following concerning Jezebel. Jesus says, I gave her time to repent. I gave her time to repent. Can you realize, uh, we won't ever realize it with our human understanding, but can you understand to a certain extent how great the mercy of God is? He's even giving a woman like Jezebel, someone who has the spirit of Jezebel, someone who is totally wicked from beginning to end. Even to her, he gives time to repent. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her fornication. Beware, I am throwing her on a bed, and those who commit adultery with her, I am throwing into great distress, unless they repent of her doings, and I will strike her children dead. What does he mean when he says, I, I will throw her on a bed? That is a euphemism. Um, a lot of times the Bible uses euphemisms. A euphemism is a way of saying something, but you don't say it as harshly. You basically say it in a softer way. But <clears throat> it's a euphemism for saying, listen, I gave this woman time to repent. She refuses to repent. I'm giving her over to her sin. She flourishes in darkness, so all that I'm doing is I'm giving her over to the darkness. Let's quickly turn to Romans chapter 1, then you'll see what I mean. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Let's look at verses 24 to 20. Let's, let's look at verses 24 to 32. Now the Apostle Paul here is speaking about people who are godless and people who don't want to repent. Just like Jezebel. He says the following. Uh, let's go, let's go, I'm sorry, let's go a bit further back. Let's go to verse 22. I'm sorry, I'm messing you around now. Let's go to verse 18. The guilt of humankind. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all, all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, His eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, has been understood and seen through the things he has made, so they are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds are darkened, or were darkened. Verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles. Therefore God gave them up, listen carefully to verse 24, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. You'll see that later in, in Revelation chapter 2, it says that um, 
Um, all the churches will know that I am the one who searches minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say I do not lay on you any other burden. So what happened was, when the Lord refers to the deep things of Satan, he's referring to occult practices. So once again, as we said, where you have the spirit of Jezebel, you have witchcraft. So witchcraft crept into the church. Now the Lord says um, that, you know, this is typically, typically what happens in witchcraft. You reach, you go through certain levels and you reach a higher level and they tell you you are your own God and, you know, whatever else nonsense they tell you. And you basically worship the creation and not the creator because a lot of times people in witchcraft will also worship what they refer to as nature spirits and they worship a spirit of water and a spirit of fire and whatever so they worship the creature rather than the creator okay and now it says for this reason Romans chapter 1 verse 26 for this reason God gave them up to degrading passions their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural and in the same way also the men giving up natural intercourse with women were consumed with passion for one another men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own passions the due penalty for their error and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God God gave them up this is what I meant earlier God gave them up to a debased mind and do things that should not be done. So God gives everyone time to repent. But if you keep on being stubborn and you do, and, and you refuse to repent, just like Jezebel did. He says, listen, since you love the darkness so much, I'm giving you over to a debased mind. I don't like it. But if you love the darkness so much and you eventually die in your sin and you die in all the horrifying things that you do, so be it. You will die and you will be lost forever in eternal darkness and you will eventually be cast in the lake of fire at the day of judgment. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind and to things that should not be done. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness, they are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious towards parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, yet they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. Jezebel clearly applauded the prophets of Baal. That, was, that is why she was so, that's one of the reasons that she was so angry when Elijah um, ordered the people to kill the prophets of Baal after the events on, the Mount, uh, on, on Mount Carmel. How dare you destroy my lie that I'm living? How dare you destroy my prophets who serve the master of lies? That's how arrogant people become. And that's why Paul also says in his letters to Timothy, um, 2 Timothy, is it 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 5, he says that in the end days people will be lovers of the lie. They will be slanderers. They will hate God. They will, they will, they will love the lie. That's, that's, that's how people will be. And that is exactly what we see in our day and time. Nothing has changed. Nothing. To everyone, uh, Revelation 2, Revelation 2 from verse 26, to everyone who conquers and who con and continues to do my works to the end, I will give authority over the nations to rule them with an iron rod as when clay pots are shattered. This is um, referring to some of the Messianic Psalms, especially uh, Psalm 2 and Psalm 110, where Jesus is described as the ruler with a rod of iron who shatters clay pots. The nations conspire against God and God laughs at them 
and he tells them, I have installed my king, which is Jesus, on the Mount Zion, and he is the one. He is also, according to Psalm 110, the one who is called the a king after the order of Melchizedek, which refers back to Genesis chapter 14, when Jesus, in the form of Melchizedek, appeared to Abraham and gave him bread and wine, which is a foreshadowing of the Last Supper. Okay? Jesus is the King of Peace, the King of Truth, the King of Righteousness. He is the King of Kings. And to those who continue in the faith until the very end, He will give the right to rule alongside Him in the New Jerusalem. And that's what He says here, I will give authority to you over the nations, to rule them with an iron rod as when clay pots are shattered. Even as I also received authority from my Father, to the one who conquers, I will also give the morning star. Now, I just want to stand still here for a moment because we've mentioned New Age and we've mentioned the occult and the spirit of Jezebel and all these things. There's a popular lie going around in our day and time, which is actually nothing new. But this lie claims um, you will find it among uh, people who are high up in Freemasonry, uh, Luciferianism and those, those type of things. They will tell you when you tell them that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Then they tell you this lie. They tell to you. They tell you, uh, listen. Let me tell you something. I have news for you. Did you know that Jesus Christ is Lucifer? Now you get a fright. You think, oh my goodness. And they use verses in Revelation out of context to justify this lie because. Jesus says, I will give to you, we endure to the end, I'll give you the morning star. Now they claim that because Lucifer is referred to, referred to as the morning star, they claim that Jesus and Lucifer is one. But that's not what the Bible says. How you have fallen from heaven, Lucifer, son of the morning or son of the dawn, as the King James uh, puts it. What happens is, Jesus Christ is the true morning star. Is the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. What does Lucifer do, Satan? Satan tries his best to imitate everything Jesus does. Why? Because he's a deceiver. Now, Lucifer is referred to as the morning star and he tells you, I'm the true morning star. But who's the true morning star? It's Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is not Lucifer. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Satan is also referred to by the, by the Apostle Peter as a roaring lion. Who is the lion of the tribe of Judah? It's Jesus Christ. What does Satan do? He knows Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So once again, he imitates him by being like a roaring lion. You see... So don't let anyone tell you that Jesus Christ and Lucifer is the same. It's a, it's a lie from the pit of hell. Okay. Then the last verse, it says, Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Obviously, once again, it refers back to Jesus who said, He quoted the prophet Isaiah constantly and he said, Those who have ears, let them hear. Those who have eyes, let them see. Okay. So that's... Um, that's that for um, our study today. Um, may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you. May God the Father shine the light of Jesus Christ upon you. May, his, may He shower you with mercy and love and grace and peace in abundance. Uh, may the powerful working of the Holy Spirit as God, comforter and protector be with you. And please pray for me. I have faced numerous attacks from the enemy over the past few days um, the enemy is attacking me non-stop and um, it's ever since i've been doing these studies about revelation about the letters to the churches um, the devil has been attacking me non-stop um, the other night at our uh, prayer group because we are my wife and i are in a house church um, and usually on Friday nights we have a meeting with our fellow believers in the house church and I told them to 
please pray for me and my wife. Please pray for our marriage because the devil is constantly attacking me. He's constantly attacking us, trying to create strife between me and my wife. So please, brothers and sisters, all of you who are watching this, I ask you to please pray for pray for me, pray for us. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face and his light to shine upon you. Uh, on, on you and your children and their children unto a thousand generations. I love you all and may Christ Jesus bless you. Goodbye.